Hi. Hi. Um, it's hard to say anything to follow up on that, I think. Um, while our panelists come and sit at the um, dais, please, you'll turn your attention to them when this won't be up anymore. Um, I just want to say, kind of put this in context, which they will also do, and I think the movie did a fabulous job of this, but I just want to remind us that this, it was set in Portland, Oregon, right? But this is not a story about Portland, right? This is a story about every city in the U.S. Um, and you know, remember, they talked about um, a quarter of households don't have enough savings um, to live for three months at a poverty level income. So, you know, most families, but that's of any kind of savings. If you think about liquid savings only, if you take people's houses out of that equation, we have 45% of people in this country. That's nearly half, right, of people in this country who are one uh, accident, one broken down car, one uh, illness away from these kinds of situations. So this is not them, this is us, right? This is all of us. So um, I want us to remember that. Um, okay, so now I'm going to do three panelists. Um, okay, I'll go in order. So first, we have Harry Gans, who is um, the director and producer of the film. Um, he and his brother Joe are the Emmy Award-winning filmmakers behind the production company View Film and the film that we just saw. The film had a successful premiere on HBO in March 2013. It has been followed by Nationwide Outreach, this is part of this, an engagement campaign that is taking the film to communities across the country to create impact and social change. Um, their work has been both critically and co um, commercially acclaimed for its exploration of the most intimate aspects of people's lives and relationships. Um, and they're best known as the creators of the win Emmy-winning HBO documentary series Taxi Cab Confessions. Um, next is Seal Zalkind. From, she is the executive director. Okay, hold on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, of ACNJ, Advocates for Children of New Jersey. She's been there uh, for 25 years, started as the Director of Policy and Research and is now the Executive Director. And she has spent years um, advocating for these issues across New Jersey. Um, next, we have um, Walter Kalman. is the executive director of the New Jersey chapter of the uh, National Association of Social Workers, which is one of the largest chapters in the country. Um, in this role, he strives to inform and motivate social workers, providing them with the tools to carry out social work's core values in enhancing the well-being of individuals, families, and communities through informed social work practice. Throughout his 40-year career in health and human services, he has worked as a social work practitioner, administrator, political sciences, political and act social activist, and a campaigner for social change. And finally, hi, Serena. <laughs> we have Serena Rice, is the executive director of the New Jersey Anti-Poverty Network. She's been a member of the network since 2003. She's a graduate of us, of the Rutgers School of Social Work. She was in 2004 with a concentration administration policy and planning. Since then, she has worked in the areas of policy-directed research and anti-poverty advocacy. Her research has included in-depth studies on welfare to work, cost of living, and the consequences of poverty. So I don't want to take up any more time because I'd like to turn it over to the panelists. Um, and what I'd like to start with Harry, um, if you could just give us a little bit of sen a sense of why, why you decided to do this and how you did this. And, um, and uh, we'd love to take questions from the audience. Um, I think we might try to do that. I don't quite know how, <laughs> but I'll think about it. Um, meanwhile, let me just say one other thing. Can you guys pass those sign-up sheets to the, the, this side, whatever side that is. Left, right? Right. Okay, thank you. Oh, it's not going to come to this, though. Good afternoon. Uh, my brother and I, uh, in 2009, 2010, uh, we saw what was going around, uh, what was going on around us. Everybody knew somebody who had been affected by the Great Recession. Everybody knew somebody in our own family, in friends and neighbors who had lost their house or lost their job. And we saw uh, several documentaries that had been made about the causes of the Great Recession. Uh, best known of that was Inside Job. It sort of gave a layman's explanation of how, what happened on Wall Street to cause the Great Recession. Uh, but there was very little done on the human toll. 
And uh, we read an article in the LA Times where we live about the 211 service in Orange County. Prior to that, we didn't know what 211 was. Um, and it was an article about how uh, in this bastion of wealth, there was this underbelly of poverty that um, was growing and growing, and their call volumes had doubled. And uh, so we called up 211 and asked them if they'd allow us to come down and listen in on some calls. And we did that, and we were blown away by the, um, the, 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 the um, immense immensity of the human suffering that these operators were listening to every day. And so we decided to make this film. And um, we worked at the 211 in Portland, Oregon. Whenever uh, families called in, um, if, if we thought it was a story worthy of following, we asked them if they'd be willing to participate. We'd go out and interview them, and if they wanted to, we, we'd start making the film. The film came out um, in 2013, last year, and after it came out, we got hundreds, if not thousands of calls from organizations all over the country, whether they were nonprofits, obvious nonprofits that work with um, uh, poverty, like the United Way, community action agencies, but local organizations, religious organizations, political organizations, unions, who all felt that the film somehow hit a chord with uh, sort of uh, the emotions of what it felt like to go through this. And um, sad to say, it took the middle class falling into poverty to bring attention to this. Because of course, because of course, chronic poverty had been going on for years and years. But um, we thought it was our obligation after we saw this response to start this outreach campaign. And that's what we've been doing. We've been uh, screening the film around the country with organizations, with universities, who are already working on this issue to inspire and ignite uh, a debate. So to um, try to uh, inspire some changes on the local, state, and national level when it comes to government policies and also to um, ignite all of us to have the will to make restoring the middle class our number one priority. And I think the media has done a decent job. If you're a media or news junkie like I am, over the last year and a half, you've seen more about income inequality, more about poverty, more about uh, unemployment than you have for the last 10 or 20 years. Uh, sad to say that uh, with recent events, at least in the national news, and uh, the, uh, the warmongers, uh, you know, uh, starting to e escalate again, um, it not only has taken, uh, you know, the news away, but it has uh, um, obviously going to cut into the budget. And um, uh, I feel it is our job now to keep this issue in the public conscience, to do screenings like this with the next generation of advocacy, uh, advocates, and um, that's why we're here today, and uh, so I'll be happy to talk more about it, but for now we'll go on. Well, I have to begin by saying I wish today wasn't the first time that I had seen this film. Um, I've seen clips of it, certainly I've never seen the whole film. Um, I find myself incredibly moved, um, and it's very difficult to talk about it. Um, I came prepared actually to talk to you about data today um, and what the data says about New Jersey. Um, my organization, Advocates for Children of New Jersey, publishes the Kids Count Report, which is a report on child well-being statewide in counties and in certain cities like Newark, Camden, uh, Trenton, Patterson. I know Serena is going to talk a little more uh, because Legal Services New Jersey and the Anti-Poverty Network has done a tremendous amount of work um, trying to address the poverty issue in New Jersey. Um, but I guess I want to start where I intend up, which is what I think this means. Um, I guess to me, more than anything else, this puts a face on poverty. Um, and it's not a face that looks any different than all of you sitting around this room or to me and my family. If you look at those families, it was an incident, an illness, a job loss, an economy that tanked that sent these people over the edge. Um, all of us, I think, unless we live in families who are very wealthy and have given us that foundation where we, as someone I recently read said, we started the race in mid-course, um, we all, I think, can face that. And I hope that that would develop a sense of compassion in all of us. Um, I think the tenor of the poverty now is too much about the deserving and undeserving poor and not enough about what every family and every individual needs as this film is. 
um, there's been uh, certainly a lot of reaction to the kinds of press that Harry was talking about. When we do our kids count reports, we're in fact releasing a school breakfast report tomorrow about making sure that children who are low income and eligible for free breakfast get it. I can guarantee you, and I've stopped reading them, if it's covered by the press, I would say nine out of 10 of the comments that follow that article will be negative. They'll be, why do those families have kids? Why is it my responsibility to feed someone else's child? What does it matter? I take care of my family, why can't they take care of theirs? Um, I think that, to me, more than anything, this film raises the issue of compassion. And there's not the deserving and undeserving poor. I don't know if any of you have read Nicholas Kristof, who writes in the New York Times. I'm a recent follower of his, and he has a number of columns. I hope if you haven't seen him, check him out online, because he writes in the most compelling way about the that being poor is not whether you're deserving or undeserving, that everyone, as this film tries to say, needs help from time to time or when they hit an unfortunate circumstance. So I hope more than anything that this brings out that sense of compassion, that there's not us and them, that there's not the deserving and the undeserving poor, but as they ended up, as one of the family said in the film, we're all in this together. And I guess I'd like to say I'd like that to inspire you, not just in your individual practice, because I'm looking around this room. I'm assuming some of you already are working directly with families. Many of you, that's your, your life's goal, to bring that sense of compassion into what you do. It's not a difficult, it's, a, it's actually a very difficult field to work in. And it's easy to lose sense of who those individuals are. But when you think about this film and who these families are, and not only the fact that this happened to them, but the incredible impact, starting with things like the basics of putting food on the table, then losing their homes, and the stress, the incredible stress that you saw developing in those families. So I hope as social workers, you bring that sense of compassion with you. But I'd also like this to fire up your advocacy. Um, I was listening to someone uh, making a speech last year, I, last week actually here from New Jersey. Judge Grant, who runs the administrative office of the courts. And he said he remains very optimistic and hopeful about how we are looking at social problems. And I found myself sitting back in his seat and thinking, you know, I have a lot of respect for you, but I think that's a little crazy. Um, but when I thought about it, I really believe he's right. I think the vast majority of people, the vast majority of people would be sympathetic and compassionate. It's the vocal minority who seems to be driving the dialogue. And that's vocal minority, whether it's those comments in the newspaper or in a nonpartisan way, who we're electing to office. So I would hope that this would inspire in you not just the compassion in your families in, that you serve, but also your advocacy that you really can make a difference as a professional and as an individual. We can stand up, I think, and say, this is not the direction we want our country to go. I think it's very easy to feel helpless, hopeless, um, but I don't think that needs to be the case. You can do that by getting politically involved. You can do that. You can sign up at ACNJ. Our website is www.acnj.org. We do a listserv, uh, an action alert network that keeps people up to date on state policies, on legislation will keep you informed, enable you to be active, contact your local, county, state, and federal officials. There are ways to mobilize. Your vote is important. Who you vote for and what we demand from our candidates. If you look at just my opinion, if you look at how the Tea Party arose in this country, I still think it's a minority, but it's a very vocal minority. And they've managed to change the direction of the conversation. I think we can do that too. Um, so let me just end where I wanted to start, which was to give you a picture, or really tell you that uh, we're, Oregon is not unique. You can talk about these same issues here in New Jersey, too. Um, I mentioned that we publish the Kids Count Report. Every year we look at indicators of child well-being. We look at child poverty in New Jersey. Um, and in fact, the census data came out uh, about two weeks ago, and it showed that New Jersey has the dubious distinction of being one of two states where child poverty increased rather than decreased. 
uh, New Jersey and West Virginia. Our child poverty rate is uh, now 15%, came up from 13%. Doesn't sound like much when you think about, okay, 13% of kids across the state. But that's not the true picture of poverty in New Jersey. We looked at the cities, the top 10 cities in our state in terms of child poverty. Camden, for example, 52% of children in Camden live in families with incomes below the federal poverty line. Lakewood Township, 47%. Patterson, 46%. Newark, 44%. Union City, 40. Passaic, 37. Jersey City, 35, and so on. Trenton, 35%. In those top 10 cities, one in three children live in families who are earning income below the federal poverty level. And I just want to remind all of us what that means. We talk about the federal poverty level, we're talking about an income of about $22,000 a year for a family of four. I challenge you to live in a state like New Jersey that has the highest housing uh, costs in the country and, and actually is the worst in the country for parents paying too much of their income on rent. It's impossible, impossible to have stable housing, put food on the table, on a poverty level income. And think about that. We're talking about one of every three children. And in some of these cities, Camden, Lakewood, Patterson, we're talking about nearly one of every two, every other child living in a family earning below poverty level. Um, I think that's data. And to me, we can talk about the data all we want, but I think this film puts, on a, puts a face on it in a way that I think any dialogue doesn't. The last thing I would also mention is there's recent data that came out from the Federal Department of Education, which found that uh, the number of homeless students in our state has risen dramatically. There are now 8,660 homeless students in the, New, in the Jersey, New Jersey public schools. It's a 77% increase from last year. That's tremendous. Now, some of that certainly could be attributed to Hurricane Sandy and the aftermath, but not all of it. Some of it is just like the families we saw in the film, who've lost housing, who can't afford to find a place for, for them and their children to live. Lots of solutions. I don't know if we come back around to that. Uh, as an agency, our focus has been on making sure that families get the assistance that they need. So things like food stamps, our families actually act, accessing food stamps. Uh, we've uh, been very focused on school breakfast uh, the federal government has a fed free and reduced lunch and breakfast program. New Jersey is in the bottom of the country in serving eligible children breakfast. Um, three years ago when we launched our campaign, New Jersey was serving about 35% of eligible children breakfast. That's ridiculous. It's a free meal that's available to eligible children every day, and we weren't doing it. I can tell you even more shocking is the reason why. It's actually not because of money. Um, and in fact, if we reached out and served more children breakfast, we'd bring more money into the state, the federal money to reimburse it. Um, it's logistics. It's a school district having to decide to do things differently, to serve breakfast not at a central location before school starts, when kids are not in school, but to do it in the classroom, breakfast after the bell. Our campaign has been very exciting to us. Over the last three years, we've improved the participation rate. 50% more kids are now accessing breakfast. We've moved up the national rankings, but in real terms, it's 75,000 children who are now getting breakfast who are eligible and not getting it before. So we need to keep an eye on those programs to make sure that families know about them, but more importantly, that you're not just handing over a phone number, but helping that family access those programs, navigate some very complicated systems we have to make the linkages for families, even when that's not in your particular area. They don't have anybody to help them do that. It's a confusing, complicated system. So making sure that we access those benefits. New Jersey has a very strong state child health insurance program, probably the best in the country. We have to make sure that kids and families enroll in it. So that's been our focus as an advocacy organization, to take small bites of this and make sure that those programs in place that can help families remain in place and can be used. I'll turn it over to Walter. Uh, 
Um, being a policy person, I'd like to think that this audience is full of policy majors here, but I know in reality the majority of you are probably working in clinical areas or intend to, to do that in your future. So one of the reasons I was asked to speak today, let me get this right, um, was to talk to you a little bit about the tools that we might have available to address some of the issues that are raised by this film. Um, let me begin by, by reminding you that the code of ethics, the social work code of ethics states, social workers should engage in social and political action that seeks to ensure that all people have equal access to the resources, employment, services, and opportunities they require to meet their basic human needs and to develop fully. Social should be aware of the impact of the political arena on practice and should advocate for changes in policy and legislation to improve social conditions in order to meet basic human needs and promote social justice. That's just one part of the, of the code, but it is an essential part that we often forget about when we are in our day-to-day -day practice, whether you're working in schools or hospitals or in, uh, in a private practice setting. Um, and so we often have to remind ourselves that to be a social worker means to do both parts of that. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, some of the stuff, though, that uh, Seal has just brought up uh, in reference to what some of the messages this film uh, brings to you. This, um, we seem to be a nation that of America, some of you may know the term American exceptionalism, and we often feel like we are different. We're better in some ways than, um, than other folks, than other people around the world. Um, the, the language that you heard today, the language you heard today in terms of uh, the toxic kinds of language that people use, not intentionally, but when they started, when people started to talk about how traditional people seeking social services, as though there's a different class that, that seeks out social services. Um, the, the one gentleman that talked about feeling like a deadbeat to rely on food stamps. Um, that's, a, that's an attitude of social workers, even if you're not a policy person, you're not a community organizer, that you can be working on with your clients to help them understand that it's not, there's nothing wrong with accepting help. There's nothing wrong with going out and, and helping your neighbors because someday you might be needing that, that same kind of help. Um, it, we're, in so many ways, we're, we've become a nation of extremes. It, you know, you hear the statistics about how the 1% of the population now owns 90% of the wealth. Um, and even while capitalism is not going to go away and we're always going to be working and uh, living in a capitalist society, you have a choice. You could live like the, uh, you could be Warren Buffett who created a pledge program that asks billionaires to dedicate 50% of their income to a charity. Um, and he's had, through that program, he's raised over $124 billion that have gone into social service programs. Or you could be the generals of the war on the middle class, the Koch brothers. Um, I just saw, I saw in a letter today that pointed out better than any, any I could, um, saying the Koch brothers are responsible for hurting the middle class. Um, the Koch brothers are good for business. Yes, and cigarette smoking is good for your health. Who else but a member of the board of directors of the Americans for Prosperity would want you to believe this? It was an editorial last week in the Star Ledger by, by the head of the Americans for Prosperity. Americans for Prosperity is funded by the Koch brothers. And once again, the government is the bad guy. If only we would leave business alone, the benefits would trickle down, and we'll all have community centers and art centers, and no one will be poor. Where have we heard this before? We've been waiting for this trickle since Ronald Reagan was president. But now the Koch brothers, an anti-middle class radical group, is no longer flying below our radar. It has to fight back with goodwill ads on television and guest columnists who give the appearance of neutrality. It's especially disturbing that this columnist used her religious commitment of helping people to make her case. While she writes about discouraging lobbying and special favors, it's these practices that the Koch brothers have used for their own monetary benefit. One does not have to be on the left to know that the far-reaching and covert activities of this, this group have influenced, if not written, legislation that is responsible for the continuing decline of the middle class and the quality of life in this country. Um, we, we all can't be out fighting on the, uh, you know, demonstrating in the streets, uh, although we'd like, like you all perhaps to go down and uh, join Occupy, join Occupy when it's, uh, this, oh, okay, yeah, this, maybe the battery's dying? No. All right, thanks. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, 
As much as we'd like you all to go out and join Occupy when they, uh, they set up their tents outside on Wall Street, we know we're not always going to do that. But there are lots of ways that you as social workers can have a great influence on a day-to-day -day basis. One way is simply to help your clients understand these issues around help and around poverty and understand that it is not, it's not wrong to be able to take, to, to take help. It's not, there's nothing wrong, you're not a deadbeat because you go out and get food stamps. If you're going to be in a clinical setting, you're certainly going to be dealing with issues of mental health. You saw examples of that in this film um, where uh, people were on the verge of depression and other kinds of things because of the situations they're dealing with. Um, the gentleman who's, who ha whose son has Down syndrome in the film. We spend three, four, five times as much to keep people in segregated institutional settings as we do to provide community services. Certainly, he could have used some kind of assistance for his son's circumstances. Um, so there are ways, as a, as, even as a consumer, you can be a green consumer. Don't, don't patronize Walmart. Um, they're the ones that are more responsible than probably any other corporation in the country for cr crushing small businesses, for putting, as some of you may be aware, that Walmart at one point would teach their employees how to get on Medicaid. Rather than provide health care services, the largest corporation in the world, basically, is teaching their employees to get on Medicaid in order to get their, their health care services. Those kinds of things. You patronize a place like Panera that has these uh, uh, special sites where they, they help people who are in need and who are food hungry. So there's lots of ways you can, you can accomplish that as a social worker in your daily professional practice, in your advocacy work, or in other me methods. Um, and part of that, because so many, as I look around, around the crowd, are, of you are millennials. Um, one of the things we, know, we see is that millennials aren't joiners. Um, uh, certainly, we know that in, within NASW, we have a, a smaller number of the population of social workers who are millennials joining than we did people who are my age, baby boomers. And so, one of the ways to, to be able to work is to work collectively. That is, to, to Margaret Mead quote about uh, uh, let it be, n uh, never doubt that a small group can uh, make major change. In fact, that's all that ever has done. I'm sure I'm butchering her, her quote, but the point is that joining together with associations like NASW, joining groups like ACNJ and supporting their work, those are the kinds of things we don't see enough of today in millennials. You tend to be a, a generation of non-joiners. Uh, social media substitutes for, for collective action. One of the things we want to encourage you to do is certainly join collectively in various efforts that will enable you to be able to use, use all of our efforts to change these circumstances. Um, with that, let me let Ms. Serena. You guys have been sitting and listening for a long time, so I'm going to start out with a little audience participation. Um, I'm going to ask you about a couple of explanations that I've heard for the stories that we just watched. Um, and I just want you to raise your hand if you've heard these explanations. I don't, I'm not asking if you agree with them, to be clear. I just want to know if you've heard them. First of all, America is founded on the principle of hard work. If you're willing to work hard, you can get ahead. You know heard that? Yeah, pretty much everyone, huh? Yeah. Um, put a little more bluntly. People are poor because they're lazy. Why should I help someone who doesn't want to work? Gosh, still almost everyone has heard that. That's disturbing. Um, here's one that sounds a little more than all. If people knew how to budget, they wouldn't be in the situation they're in. And last one, and this one I've actually really heard from all levels of the political spectrum. There's a culture of poverty. We need to pe teach people to expect more for themselves so they'll be motivated to pull themselves out of poverty. Heard that one. I bring this up because all of these statements have one thing in common. They all provide explanations for why people are in poverty. And um, I was just this week actually listening to a, a webinar about some new research from the Center for Community Change that looked at the ways that we talk about economic struggle and one of the most interesting findings from that research was that the what we talk about, the stories and the struggles, they're less important 
than the why we assign to them in terms of how they motivate our action in response. Um, and why is really at the heart of where we fix blame. And so that's where we look to fix the problem. And it's really crucial to understand this because if we're attaching the blame to the person as opposed to the system that person is trapped by, we're gonna look to change them rather than changing their circumstances. And um, when I was a social work student here about 12 years ago, one of my first classes, I remember learning that the fundamental theory of social work is person in environment, right? And I know that most of the social work training people are heading into the, the clinical world, but it's essential for us to know that as social workers, we don't believe we can fix the problems simply by addressing the person. The person exists within a set of circumstances, and if those circumstances are trapping them, they're reducing their options, they're not going to be able to do anything on their own. We need to address the circumstances. Um, the, the film shows a number of answers to the question of why people are caught in these kinds of struggles. It talks about gaps in health insurance, the high cost of housing, utilities, unemployment, low wages. Um, these are all stories that are also part of the why here in New Jersey. And I want to add a little bit to the why in New Jersey specifically, because as you'll share, this is one of the most expensive places to live in the country. Um, and what we really have, what sort of adds to our why picture here is unemployment is actually a fairly small part of the problem. Even though it, New Jersey has not recovered in terms of employment from the Great Recession the way other areas of the country have, even if we had great employment here, we'd still have a problem because we have a structural economic uh, mismatch in the way that our jobs relate to our cost of living. Um, recent data that's, that's come out in the last month shows that somewhere between one quarter to one third of all households in New Jersey are struggling to meet ends wait, it, make ends meet, and that's regardless of whether or not they're working. Um, and I just, just sort of make a little commercial for my former organization, Legal Services of New Jersey. They put out this study called The Real Cost of Living. It's available online, just Google Poverty Research Institute Real Cost of Living. There's a wealth of data here about um, what it actually costs to make ends meet in New Jersey. Seal shared the information about child poverty at the federal poverty line, and those statistics are shocking in terms of our cities. But that income is radically below what it actually costs to make ends meet in most areas of our state. On a statewide average, it costs $64,000 a year to support a two with two school-aged kids. And that's not the most expensive family type that we have in our state. With younger children who require child care goes way up. Um, and, and the problem with such a high cost of living is that our jobs aren't supporting that level of income. Um, even for just a single person in New Jersey who is only looking out for their own needs to cover all of their needs, they need an average hourly wage of $13.25 an hour. That's if they're working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year. You need $13.25 for a single person. Um, the minimum wage in New Jersey is $8.25. It's even lower than the Portland one. Um, that's an annual income of just $17,160. And if you're a tip worker, it's even worse. You get $2.13 an hour because your tips are supposed to make up the difference, but unfortunately often they don't. Um, and it's not just even minimum wage work. New Jersey tracks wage data for all the large occupational categories. For the 18 categories that have more than 100,000 workers in them, seven of them have an average hourly wage below that $13.25 an hour, below the self-sufficiency wage for a single adult with no kids. Um, and, and I just, throwing all this data at you because it's really important to understand this is the why. It's not lack of individual effort. It's that our jobs are not paying enough and it's the low wage jobs that are growing in New Jersey. Um, and so that really has to push our, our thinking about what is the solution. Certainly a system is a part of that solution. Seal mentioned a number of food stamps and health insurance. Um, I could, I could add to that list, but I think we also do need to be looking at the income side as well and supporting better jobs. 
Um, New Jer uh, the Anti-Poverty Network, my organization, is behind um, national efforts for a minimum wage increase. Um, on the national level, there is a, uh, a bill, the Wage Act, which would raise the national minimum wage to 10.10 .10 an hour over the next three years, and then would index it to inflation. Clearly, this won't fix the problem entirely in New Jersey. Um, if you need 1325, and we're only talking about raising it to 1010, we're not getting all the way there. But that will have an effect on the jobs just above minimum wage as well. It would make a real difference for New Jersey. Um, and that bill would also raise the tipped minimum wage to 70% of the, of the federal minimum wage. So that would make a huge difference for people who are currently only getting 213 an hour. Um, my, for my last comment, I just um, wanted to follow up on stole my thunder a little bit reading from the Code of Ethics, which I was going to recite for you guys. Um, but I do just want to encourage everyone here that, that this really is at the heart of who we are as social workers. Regardless of your area of practice, we have an ethical responsibility, according to our code, to be involved in social action and to be promoting um, awareness and political change around areas of economic injustice. And so, actually, in a lot of ways, it's more important for those of you who are in private practice and in direct service to be saying this than for me and Walter, because we're the professional advocates, right? We stand up and talk about this and people say, oh yeah, yeah, you're paid to do that. If you guys are out there talking to your friends, talking to the millennial community, as Walter said, um, getting, getting to folks who aren't gonna be listening to us, that's what's gonna make the change because we're not gonna change the system until we change attitudes. Um, and so I would just really encourage you to, yeah, if you, if you don't wanna sign up for the listservs for, for ACNJ and Anti-Poverty Network, we've got Facebook feeds too. Follow us on Facebook, share our, the feeds that we put up, share the information that we're sharing, because when you actually look at the reality, it's incredibly convincing. But the problem is that we don't have the funds of the Koch brothers to be putting out the ads, and, and, and the misinformation is really guiding the national dialogue, and we need to take that national dialogue back. Would any of the panelists like to respond to anything anyone said and keep um, talking? The other thing we could do is take some questions from people. Do you uh, guys I would just like to say one yeah, thing please. quickly, and that is that um, I don't think that just going on Facebook and uh, doing social media is going to be enough. Um, that if you look at what uh, the NRA has done as an example, where they have transferred their love of guns throughout the nation into a political force that it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, when the NRA representative comes to your congressional office, you're shaking in your boots. And imagine if, maybe they do shake when Walter comes up to the state representative, I don't know. But imagine if he had the same uh, backing. Every, every social worker was a member. Everyone was contributing dues, and everyone was sharing with their friends the love they have of their community and people. In the same way the NRA does with guns, you would be a huge political force. And we may not have the money of the NRA, but with 48 million people across the country living near the poverty line, with all these poor children in your state, if you register people to vote and you start a movement that is more than just going on Facebook, but looking at uh, your obligation to the bigger picture, to organizations that represent advocacy and being active members, then you can make a difference. If you look at what's happened over the last 20 years in the minimum wage laws, where no one was thinking about changing any minimum wage, wage laws 20 years ago, and grassroots efforts to first, with language, as you mentioned, the word living wage didn't exist 20 years ago. They created that word to start a movement, and when the federal government wouldn't do enough, and when the state governments wouldn't do enough, they started going to city by city. And this year, Seattle has passed a $15 minimum wage law, other cities have passed minimum wage laws, and you can work this locally, state, and federally. So is there anybody in this room who isn't registered to vote? Could we shame you? Could you raise your hands if you're registered to vote? Okay, you're not being honest. How many uh, weeks do we have until you can reg stop reg Can you still register in New Jersey? Got week. That's the first yes, thing you got to do. So you can't just go home and work on your homework and turn on ESPN. You have to go out there and do something. I didn't come all this way just to watch this film and say, okay, I'm helpless. 
You have organizations here you can volunteer for, you have groups that you can support, and uh, you have to get involved if you want this to change. Hard to follow that, too. <laughs> um, I guess I wouldn't want anyone leaving here overwhelmed or that this is too big a problem, too big an issue to take on. It isn't. And I think as I'm listening, listening to the rest of the panel, listening to Harry, we have some great examples in our state of how we have managed to hold on to things that are important despite a very difficult political environment, despite a horrible economic environment, more so in New Jersey than any other state. We have, you know, we're, we're, ACNJ is very um, behind the issue of high quality preschool. We have to look for families now, but we have to look at the future as well. And that children who have high quality preschool have a much better chance of being ready for school success in school. And New Jersey actually has the best preschool program in the country for about 50,000 three and four year olds who live in the lowest income districts of the state. I'm not going to ask you if you've ever heard of Abbott versus Burke, because I would hope that you all had. I'm just going to assume that. But we had that by a Supreme Court decision. We're now a model for the rest of the country. So we had a governor who ran on a platform of preschoolers babysitting. And it's a nice idea, but we just can't afford it. So we were a little worried when he came into office. And there were two attempts to cut back on our preschool program. And advocacy by people like you and by parents school district personnel, child care programs pushed that back. And we maintain in this economic climate a $650 million annual investment in preschool. That's pretty significant. We've seen the same thing in our family care program. This is our program for low income uh, families with children. Um, we have maintained again, I think it's the best program in the country in terms of serving the highest number of people uh, with the richest array of services. Let me tell you, that was on the cho chopping block too, and it hasn't been cut. And there's been a commitment to enrollment. So even I think about how can we tackle this problem? We can tackle it in small steps, and we can also focus on what we've done already. We can build on that. We, we can make a difference. There are many other policies in our state. Recent, uh, at a re recent workshop where I was reminded that New Jersey is one of two states that has a Family Leave Act. We tend to forget that. That actually started right here at Rutgers with an advocacy group here who pushed that through. That depended on people like you who got that through the legislature in the face of business that was adamantly opposed to having family leave here in New Jersey. It does work. It does matter. Uh, and again, I would reiterate, what Harry said, what I said, I think what the rest of the panel has said, you have to step up. You have to step up as an individual. You have a responsibility, I think, when you're in your community and someone says something like Serena said about the undeserved, kind of, well, if they could just pull themselves up by their bootstraps, that'd be fine. And tell them, no, that's not quite the case. And so it starts individually, it starts professionally, but you really do have power in your vote. Um, and I think we can together change the course that we seem to be heading in for families and children. Thank you. Well, um, I'd like to take some questions from people. We have um, a microphone. So can anyone interested, we'll, we'll keep talking, but if people have questions, we'd love to um, have a conversation. Are you getting up for questions? You can, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Go, go, go. <laughs> So yeah, it, it's probably easier if people get up and make the line because we're gonna I, I'm so in agreement about that the voting really is the key. And the issue I run up against is, I mean, I live in a community with a lot of people like this, and they either don't vote or they support politicians who are blocking the policies that would help them. And I don't know how to combat that. So I'm sure one of you has the answer. <laughs> Walter. Go ahead, Walter. Yeah, sure. um, yes, I, I, I perfectly understand that. Some of the demagoguery that goes on in politics today, people, there's a, fam a book many of you may have heard of called What's the Matter with Kansas? And it's, a, it's all about the fact that, you know, people tend to vote against their, what's in their own best interests oftentimes. 
um, they get hung up. Harry referred to the NRA issue. You'll find people who might uh, might actually support some of these other ideas. The NRA, the gun thing, becomes so overwhelming that that it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, it overwhelms every every other instinct they have, um, and that's unfortunate. Part of it is is going to be educational. We're going to have to teach people at the grassroots level, and part of that is for us um, as advocates to also learn how that works. In a state like New Jersey, we have more school districts than three other st than New York, New Jersey, and Delaware combined. Uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware combined. We have an enormous uh, it, the, the cost of, of school districts costs an enormous amount in New Jersey, and yet we have these problems that Seal referred to in terms of the, of the districts. People need to learn because that's something you can affect at a local level. Um, the, the people on the Board of Education are your neighbors. Uh, the people who are on the Democratic and Republican committees in your town are your neighbors. It doesn't require you to be talking to the president or the governor or to, a or to a, someone in Congress in order to make some of these changes. And so you need to get out and help educate your, the people in your community as one way to begin that process. It's probably the most important way because we're so busy with all the other aspects of our lives that we don't have the opportunity to, to know what are those key issues. Um, we, in our member, among our membership often, we, we find that you know, we, people would like to support the issues that we're working on, but they don't know what to say. So we put together uh, actual templates of letters when we're supporting an issue so that you could just basically add your name and address to it. Um, it's one of the tools that the Koch, the Koch brothers use um, and Americans for Prosperity. So you have to sort of fight with the same political tools that are available, but it all begins with understanding and, and educating. I would just add to that that um, I think one of the attempts that I fall into is trying to make the argument on the ideological level. Um, and when you do that, it's, it's just going to be fighting, right? What you, you can't respond to sort of impassioned, I have this personal story about what happened and why I don't care. Um, you can't respond to that sort of on the passion level. You have to respond to that with evidence. Um, and that that's the only way you're ever going to convince someone is, is not by sort of yelling them down, but giving them the evidence and, and educating yourself, like Alter, Walter said, um, about what actually happens. You know, like the, the example of the minimum wage or the, the family medical leave. Um, say, okay, let's look at the places where it's been done. And the evidence is overwhelming that it actually works. It doesn't kill business. Um, it advances the, actually the economy of the area. And be, be able to come back with the evidence as opposed to the ideology. Um, and that's where you're going to be able to get the persuadables, as we call them. Um, you're never going to get the ideologues. But address the persuadables with um, the evidence. And that's how you can convince them. Another way is uh, bypass their dogma by uh, trying to affect their heart. Uh, the best emails I get are from someone who said, well, I always thought that someone who took a handout was a deadbeat, whether it was from the government or social services. But after seeing your film, I realize in this day and age, it may not be possible to do this on your own. So the economic crisis has had an impact on everyone. So we have this low wage, middle class poverty, which has kind of led to the discussion about minimum wage increases, et cetera. How do you think we can continue the conversation toward living wage and self-sufficiency wage in light of that, instead of people thinking, okay, we go to 1010, it will pull people out of poverty, but they still don't sustain a livable wage. How do we continue the conversation after the 1010? Oh, well, I think that's a very good point. The way we continue it is by bringing business small and big along with this and looking at it as our national will, the same way we did when we wanted to go to the moon. What's the most important thing this country can work towards? Is it protecting the world and us from ISIS or is it restoring the middle class and how that will benefit business as well as workers? You know, I grew up in the uh, late 60s and 70s when there was a uh, sort of an unheard of contract, unsaid contract between labor and, uh, and big business. And that, that, unheard, that unsaid contract is broken. And uh, we need to reach out to everybody, not to look at this as a right or left thing, a rich or poor thing, a business or worker thing, but as a national, local, and state priority. 
And um, that, that's a little more difficult than talking to your neighbor. Uh, as um, you know, Nick Hanauer, the billionaire in the film, pointed out, um, if the only thing you have is, is uh, the very wealthy and the very poor, you know, no one's going to shop at the stores that serve the middle class. And, and as we see, that's what's been happening. So uh, it has to do with creating the will. And a lot of that can happen, you know, by bypassing uh, um, uh, politics and, um, and all these social service agencies. Religion, every religion has a mandate to, um, you know, help those less fortunate. So there's a lot of ways we can appeal to big business and uh, take over the conversation, as you said, from the Koch brothers and put it in more, you know, uh, person to person. As you were talking right now about middle class people, in one of the part of the, of the movie, I saw that he was saying about the, the most affected people is the middle class. Who are the middle class? The middle class are the professionals who are earning around maybe, I'm not gonna put much, 100,000, 180, or 200,000 a year. And how much does people pay taxes? And if we are going to put the difference with one person who is, is earning just, I'm gonna put one million. Is not gonna pay that person because is in the middle of the is in the uh, uh, in in the middle of the leverage that it says okay this person can pay twenty five percent of the million dollar and it's not gonna be the same for the person who is earning two hundred thousand a year and it's going to pay also the other 25 percent of that 200 dollar that is a very big difference i'm not talking about the millionaires which is other other different thing it just in this in this case only is the aspect of the taxes and i know that we have to we have to do something we have to stay together and do something. What can you please tell us, I mean, how can we go against that and do what? Worth to address tax policy. <laughs> Serena. Um, I, I won't claim to be a tax expert, but there is one tax issue in particular that um, I would draw your attention to, and that was actually mentioned in the film, around um, the write-off for mortgages. That currently, a mortgage up to a million dollars, the, the up to the up to a million dollar level is the level at which the mortgage can be written off of, of federal income taxes. Um, someone who has a million dollar home probably doesn't need all of that million dollars to be written off of their taxes. And there's currently a campaign, a national campaign, called United for Homes. Again, you can Google it, find out all about it. Housing and Community Development Network of New Jersey is the New Jersey agency that's leading up our effort. And that um, campaign is looking to just reduce that cap from a million dollars down to $500,000. So $500,000 mortgage would be the limit of the write-off. Um, and all of, or most of that money, um, some of it would go to actually reduce tax burden on the lowest income homeowners. The rest of it would go into affording, uh, funding the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, which is a national trust fund that exists. It was signed into law by George W. Bush, but it has no funding. So it's not actually producing any affordable housing right now. And that one single tax change would be generating hundreds of millions of dollars for affordable housing just in New Jersey if we could get that tax change. It would take a while to ramp up, but as a long-term solution, housing is the single largest cost center for low-income families. If we could get more funding into affordable housing, it would make a dramatic difference. So that's one you know, individual tax change that could really make a difference. Can I just say something really quick? Just I want to make sure that we're all really clear on what 
I say the middle class, and it's actually really difficult to define, right? But the kind of money that you were talking about, we're talking about the top 7% of income, right? So 93% um, of earners make probably below 150. I think 100,000 is about 12%. That's, you know, 12% of people make 100,000 and more in this country. So I just want to kind of focus us back on what we're talking. The middle class are people generally between 25 and $75,000 for a household. Um, okay, and just also I want to say something about the tax structure, and they talked about this a little bit, that people at the low end of the distribution pay a much larger proportion of their income to taxes because of sales taxes, which are flat, and we all pay the same amount, right? When you buy a loaf of bread and you are rich, you're paying the same exact tax that I am as a poor person of a very different income. So um, I think that's a really important point to make. So, sorry. The issues we're talking about seem to keep escalating here. Um, I, well, from what I've seen, it, it seems like useful policy is very difficult to make happen when politicians have to split their attention between the con their actual constituents and their donors. So, and just, you know, talking about the effects of money in politics and how it can have a bigger say than the actual people. So I'm wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about that and how we might make a difference there. Well, in fact, uh, some of the more successful campaigns, I think, thinking about the president who is sitting in the White House right now, come from getting small um, in addition to those large dollars. But again, it's, a, it's about people stepping up, though. Um, you know, we, we run a political action committee um, for, for our members, and over the years, that $5 just seems like it's a lot of money when everything else is pressing on your, on your demands uh, for your income. And so people tend to scratch that off. The, uh, the, the, off, off their membership dues. Um, but in fact, that's the kind of stuff that enables politicians who aren't the big dollar folks, who aren't going to be raising the major dollars among corporations and stuff, to, to be able to compete in that. But more importantly, we do need, we need to argue for changes in the way our system is structured. Public financing of campaigns, which people often have a visceral reaction to and don't want to spend their money on, on, a, on a campaign, on electing politicians, that people don't realize that's what would enable third parties to be able to, to get into the campaign. Um, also, there's a approach now that's talking about where you could actually vote for more than one candidate for an office, and so that would enable candidates who don't raise the, have, don't have the same profile as others, uh, who don't get, aren't able to raise the same kind of dollars, to be able to get visible, visibility and, and bring their issues to the front. And that's, that's a big part of the problem that as long as politics is driven by those dollars of large donors, we're going to continue to have some of those kind of problems. People need to just realize that, you know, maybe a couple of dollars for, from everybody would be enough to make a candidate a viable candidate. So. But it doesn't mean they shouldn't hear from you. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a reality. And, you know, I think you have fewer people who want to run now because of how money drives those campaigns. But I still believe there are, there are movements, we could each identify them, that have been driven by constituents. So for those of you who are still in the room, if you live in New Jersey and you're registered, you call, you are, well, you don't even have to be registered to vote. Call the person who represents you. You each have two assembly people and one senator in your district. If you don't know who they are, that's a good way. Find out. You can go on any one of our websites. We have links to that and let them know. Make a phone call. Say you were here today and saw this movie and it moved you to say that this is an important issue for you. Um, you'd be surprised at how much hearing about that, what their constituents want, can, can make a difference. Even if it's somebody who supports you. We make that mistake all the time. When we assume this person is in our camp so we're not going to call him, we're going to talk to the opponent and then have them say, but I don't know. If I don't hear from people who vote for me, I don't know what it is that issues are. So I think that's still important. It's still important to, to I think, at least let them know 
what is on our minds and what's important to us. And it's not just at voting time, no. it's at budget time. As Martin Luther King said, every budget is a moral document. And you can find out how any one of your represented voted on any budget, what budget they approved and what they didn't. And you can see how in most state uh, houses of representative, I don't know about in New Jersey, they try to pit the social service agencies against each other. Well, if I'm going to give to food stamps, i got to take away from early childhood education, and where should I get it from? Well, the question is you should get it from other things that are less of a necessity than providing the basics for, um, you know, working class families. How you doing? My name is Adrian Schrockman. I had a two-part question, but before I get to the question, I just simply want to say that it's just not enough to become a registered voter, that you have to actively participate in the voting process, and that means learning about the platform that particular candidates are running so that you can make an informed uh, vote, and it shouldn't be uh, germane to party line, that you should be able to vote with whoever platform best suits what it is you're trying to do. So having said that, I guess my question is simply this. This is a policy question is that it's, it appears that even in that film that most of the policies are corrective as opposed to preventive. Which, by the way, preventive is far more cost effective than corrective. So I want to know to anyone on the panel, do you know of any programs or any policy that addresses preventive as opposed to corrective? Well, early childhood I education. mentioned preschool, <laughs> early childhood education. Um, I think there's so much research wherever you look. There's brain research, there's social service research, educational research that talks about the importance, not just of preschool, actually learning doesn't begin at three, but the period of birth on up through third grade, um, and how important that is long term to a child's school success, what happens after school, what happens as they grow into adults. And you know, there have been incredible cost benefit analysis. You've got economists, Steve Barnett right here at Rutgers. Um, is a national expert on this issue. The, the estimate is the dollar you invest in high quality early education, you reap $16 in preventive costs. I mean, that's an incredible investment, right? Um, and there are so many other ways. If you look at New Jersey's preschool program, it's a program that relies not just on school districts, but community childcare and Head Start to provide the high quality program. As in addition to enabling children to start school ready for success has created a workforce that's now not making poverty wages actually, below minimum wage, but are now getting salaries equivalent with that in school districts. So it's had that byproduct as well. That to me is the best example. Healthcare is another example. Um, Serena talked about housing as an example. I think that came up in the film. Um, and this cost-benefit analysis is in every area, but I think there's so much attention now to early education, high-quality early education. To me, that's a critical place to start. Yeah, and certainly healthcare, as you mentioned, is one of those areas. Um, and uh, Thomas Paine said that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, and that means the same thing for um, these preventative measures that we sometimes put into place. I think to some degree um, the housing tax credit that we talked about earlier, that started out as a preventative measure and now it's gotten to where it's out of control and it's used in ways that was never intended to begin with. So so it's that, you, you mentioned about staying involved in between elections and being informed about the issues. That's a critical part of that process because it's very easy when a small number of people are, who are highly connected are able to uh, manipulate good laws and turn them into things that we tended to be. So it, it is about con constantly re remaining aware of what's going on in, in the uh, political environment. I, just, I know Walter and Syl both mentioned this, but really healthcare is a, a major program. And I, I think we're not doing a very good job right now of celebrating the, the national healthcare program. Um, you know, most of the news stories that come out about it are about how it's not working. And the fact that families that have insurance will not face the crisis that we saw for that single mom with her, with her daughter who had stomach ulcers, that that one event can destroy a family's economics for the rest of their lives. And if you have health insurance, that doesn't happen. And so I think we really need to be cheerleaders 
for national health care, that this is a really important program and that, yeah, it's got some bugs in it, but we need to be promoting it and figuring out how to make those bugs start working instead of just destroying the program. Anybody else have a question? So what I got out of this right now is that I think all of us should write our local representatives today. What if we all wrote the governor tonight, all of us in this room, and said that these are the kinds of policies and these are the kinds of things that we are concerned about. We're concerned about families in the middle class falling into poverty. We're concerned about minimum wage laws that are very low. All of the things we talked about. That would be something. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> that would be something. And another thing I just wanted to plug for the school social work, we have a poverty and inequality course that's offered in the spring um, that is, addresses all of the issues talked about here today. It's called Policy Perspectives on Poverty and Inequality, and I would um, urge you to think about taking that as an elective. Um, anyone want to make any final comments? We have a couple questions. Oh, sorry, sorry. Good. Hello, so I'm about to finish, or I'm in my senior year of my undergraduate degree for my BSW, and I recently realized that I want to go into policy um, to make a real difference in everything. I wanted to know if you had any advice for the millennial generation on how to get involved in that. Hmm. Go ahead. Well, I know that the School of Social Work has internships because we have Rutgers interns all the time, um, and would be it certainly is a way to learn about policy, at least from our perspective, to make contacts. Um, that might be a way to use your internship in that way. Um, and we've had a number of students who have volunteered with us for short periods of time outside of a full year or a semester internship. That's one approach. And you're standing next to Renee, our advocacy coordinator, who would very much like for you to, uh, to, to talk, give you her, give you her, give you, uh, give her your contact information. Sorry, um, I get excited when somebody uh, says they want to go into policy. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, and, but part of it is I earlier talked about getting to know what's going on in your community. And one of our part, our advocacy partner organizations, is the Citizens Campaign. And uh, through that, we've developed a program called Power Civics, and we try to do that at schools around the state, um, to, at, through our unit meetings on a local level, because getting to getting involved, getting your feet wet. We know from social work that you know field education is, a, is an essential part of that. And, and being a, a good citizen has a field education component as well. It means getting out and knowing what goes on in your community. So much is governed in New Jersey at a very local level that people are not aware of that at all. You could have an enormous influence at a local level. Um, I always like to tell the, the, the story about um, how I I'm a committee man in my town, and uh, it takes 10 signatures to get on the uh, ballot, uh, uh, which is a vote that nobody votes for. And uh, I have three adult daughters, my wife and myself, so I have five signatures before I leave my house <laughs> to get on the ballot, and nobody votes on those elections, so I'm always going to get elected. And, and, and one third of the legislature turns over in every two-year cycle. People don't realize that. And you don't get to vote on those individuals. They're voted on by the local committees county committees. And so we, there's an enormous amount of influence that you can have. And getting involved at the grassroots level is a good way to, to, to learn about policy and to learn how to practice those effective techniques of community organizing. Yeah. Well, I'm sitting here because I'm a graduate of the Rutgers MSW program in administration policy and planning. So I plug that, that program definitely. But I understand that not everyone has the option of going into a master's or a bachelor's. And that doesn't mean that you can't be a voice. I just, I just want to make that really clear. It, it's, it, our, it voices as individuals is, it what, is what is powerful, not as necessarily as professionals. When I call my representative, I call as a constituent, not as the executive director of the Anti-Poverty Network. And so just find the, the source of information that makes sense to you. We've got a bunch of organizations represented here. We'd, I'll be happy to have you on our mailing list. Inform yourself and then just start just start talking. That's what's powerful. And as Walter just mentioned, you know, the easiest place to get involved is at the community level. And as former Governor Tom Kane is fond of saying to his students, the uh, origin of the word idiot is the Greek word idios. And that originally meant someone who is not involved in their own community, who stayed to themselves and didn't participate. I'll take one last question. 
I, I just wanted to point out that my, I live in a uh, middle class community. I, I live in Edison, Edison, New Jersey, and we don't have um, preschool. Um, yeah, but I know a lot of the communities around us have preschool for the kids. But when you're dealing with a governor like our current one, who actually um, my, uh, Sarah has experience with, uh, when he kicks people out of these meetings and you know, he's just sort of, it's, it's almost, you can't, you can't talk to the guy unless you're on his page. What are some tactics that you could use to, to actually really get, get to, you know, get to him, I guess, through him, yeah, without getting kicked out, of course. I have to say, you know, I've been at ACNJ a long time. This has been the most challenging period for advocacy that I've ever experienced. It is not an easy time to advocate. Um, the normal route, kind of the balance of power between the legislature, the executive branch, and the courts is, is not there. You have a legislature who's basically rolled over. You don't see a lot of things coming out of the legislature. You would think with a legislature that's controlled by one party that have some clout, but I think people have just been overwhelmed. It's been like a steamroller. Um, and we've, I have to be quite honest, we've struggled with that. I've struggled with that personally. And as an agency, how do we make headway in this climate? You know, you talk about Edison. We've had a, uh, a, a law on the books since 2008 that would have expanded state-funded preschool to 90 more school districts with the next tier of low-income families. I think Edison is on that list. It's never been funded, right? And a lot of supporters, no champions for it. I think, you know, we just keep plugging along. We keep coming up with creative ways. If we can't have the whole package, can we have a little bit? Can we convince you on this piece? If not, we'll make another argument on that. But I think one lesson we've learned from our school breakfast campaign is we turned our attention in a different direction. If this is not the opportunity to succeed on the state level, is there work to be done on the local level? That's been a real lesson for me. Our school breakfast campaign has not involved any state money. It hasn't involved a new state law or regulation. It's actually the one thing it needed was a letter from the Commissioner of Education and the Secretary of Agriculture saying if you serve breakfast in the classroom, it doesn't take away from instructional time. We had that in the first month of the campaign. It's all been local advocacy. It's all been talking to people about changing the way they do business. So for me, that's been, okay, the last four years have not been easy. Not easy to get information from the state agencies. Not easy to make the case for something that costs money. But here's a direction where not only did we help 75,000 children, but brought money into the state. So I think that creativity around what could we do while this is happening, and looking for the opportunities. There's a package of drug treatment bills that just came out of committee, bipartisan sponsorship. Who would think that this would be introduced at this point in time? And it looks like it has some traction. So it's hooking on to those opportunities too, I think, that help. I don't know if that answers your question. I, to, one more time on that education point, though. This is the second of a series of these programs that we're working on around the state on income inequality and, inc and, and economic insecurity. Um, we did the previous one in Trenton at the uh, state auditorium a few months ago. Um, we're planning the, the subsequent sessions. Try and get your neighbors out to these things. Uh, we'll be, those of your NASW members will get the information. Uh, we'll be sharing it with uh, the school and trying to get folks out to, to get people involved. That's really gonna be the way to do this. We have to do this as a broader community. Uh, no individuals, um, Seal or Serena or, or I banging on the door of a legislator is not gonna be as effective as when we show up with one of you who's a constituent who has a problem that you're dealing with. That's, that's the place that they, they begin to hear and resonate. But we still have to work together as a community to get the volume to overcome the dollars that we don't always often have for these kinds of, uh, to, to, uh, to make our case. Uh, we have to make our case with the force of human effort, so. Thank you. Thank you very much to our panelists who have come from all over New Jersey and California. Mary, Cecilia, Walter, and Serena, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming. I know Monday is very busy and I know this was tough for many of you, so I really appreciate you all coming and I hope this started something. And thank you to Dean Potter for sponsoring this.